It is Friday, December 9th. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We have a lot to go over. I mean, a ton. It's been a very busy week, um, so hopefully this is not going to be too long, but uh, we've got the Game Awards from last night and also a major update in the Microsoft acquisition of ABK with the FTC getting involved. So uh, there's a lot, and I have to film this quite late, so uh, just bear in mind, you know, usually when I'm filming these, I try to do multiple takes to have a, a really good one to use where I don't mispronounce or... Kind of uh, kind of trip over my words like I did just there, but I think those are staying this time around because we just have a lot to go over. Um, so first up, as always, our PS Plus reminder. The December PS Plus uh, essential games are now live. Make sure you claim those before they go away. And also a small update that I uh, put in the pinned comment from last week's video. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot to mention this, but for those that didn't see, um, Sony did finally at least send out more patches for two PS Plus Premium Classic games for NTSC or PAL switching options, um, and that would be Ape Escape and the first Siphon Filter. So... Um, at the very least, that's finally there, and it, and it does appear to be working correctly, as in uh, it's not in a weird uh, 60 hertz being placed in the 50 hertz container, so these games do run correctly, they work pretty good. Um, only caveat is you can't just use save files back and forth between the regions, um, so just bear that in mind, but if you've been waiting to play these games, now you can finally at least play those two. Hopefully more patches are rolled out soon for the, remain, uh, the remainder of the uh, PS Plus Classic games, and there's not many to do, but at least they're finally getting to it. Also, uh, we have some more patches for PS Plus games, which would be Assassin's Creed uh, Chronicles India and Russia. Those two games had compatibility issues on PlayStation 5, and so Ubisoft actually has addressed those problems, so they should be playable now on PS5, and they're part of the PS Plus October uh, catalog update for Extra, if you remember that. So um, now they're finally live on PlayStation 5. They're not blacklisted, so you can download them and play those. Uh, no word on Syndicate, because that's the one big major problem Ubisoft game that is uh, quite noteworthy, but nothing for that just yet. Moving on to God of War Ragnarok, a new patch. This one uh, not only has a ridiculous amount of bug fixes, I mean a ton. <laughs> the, the list is pretty huge, so if you ran into any sort of little things here and there, perhaps it was uh, fixed with this latest update, but uh, more importantly, this one also has the photo mode, so that actually came pretty quickly. Um, and it's got the typical bells and whistles that a photo mode would have, so um, you can change character expressions, field of view, focal length, camera roll, depth of field, focus distance. Um, there's also filters and brightness settings, but nice to see that's finally here because this game has so many uh, photogenic moments that uh, I even wanted to try and take a good picture of, uh, and I don't normally mess with photo modes too much. They're fun to enjoy from the sidelines because, you know, you can log on to Twitter and see so much cool stuff, but uh, at least it is finally here so close to the launch of the game. Next up, we have a rumor about an Uncharted reboot, um, and that might sound familiar because we had a story like that back in October, but this one uh, is coming from the leak.co. They're reporting that Sony had decided to reboot the series earlier this year and that they're giving the IP to an unknown developer, citing two independent sources. Naughty Dog is expected to initially assist the team, but overall will not be involved in this project. And that's all they really say. Um, Tom Henderson, writing for InsiderGaming.com, did say that they were unable to corroborate this, but if you recall, we already caught wind of this back in October, so um, that was based on two job listings where Sony flat out confirms a new team at PlayStation's Visual Arts working with Naughty Dog on an existing IP. Combine that with the prior report that Ben Studio was at one point uh, at one point assigned to working on a new Uncharted game until they wanted to be taken off of it, um, and they asked Sony. But uh, we have more and more mounting evidence that Sony is ready to return to this property, and so I am seeing some people look at this news, or rather rumor. So please keep that in mind. You kind of hear the word reboot and you think right away like, oh, they're going to just bring back essentially the same game and kind of redo it from the ground up and it's still um, a Nathan Drake story that we've already seen. But um, I wouldn't jump to that conclusion just yet. Um, I think it's very, uh, very much something where we haven't seen a mainline Uncharted since 2016. If this, if this game is just starting development, that means we're not going to see it until you know what it's 2022 right now almost 23 if the game's just starting development we won't see it until uh we won't see it until 2024 maybe it won't launch until 2025 or 6 i mean it's it's a long time away so 
Um, I'm not sure if it would be a, a traditional reboot per se, but I mean, that's enough time to where it's considered a soft reboot in some way. Maybe they'll continue the story based on another character in the same universe, which ideally is how I would want them to do it. Um, it's not like we need another Nathan Drake story, but we've seen from the Lost Legacy that you can take the core, you know, the fundamental gameplay mechanics of Uncharted, uh, the, the action, the set pieces, and you can apply that very easily to somebody else. So I would hope that's what this is going to be, but um, you know, again, pure rumor, uh, but it all, it all seems to line up that we are likely going to see another Uncharted at some point, which the IP has been setting for a, a decent amount of time anyway. Um, I think I'm ready to go back to it in a big way, which again wouldn't be until years from now. Now let's move on to all of our announcements from Jeff Keighley's The Game Awards. And uh, I, I guess we'll structure this in two ways where we'll look at the uh, mostly like PlayStation related announcements and then also some of the awards that Sony uh, picked up or games that are heavily associated uh, with Sony like Stray for example. So uh, starting off with, uh, and the thing is this was definitely uh, it felt like a state of play or some kind of PlayStation showcase because this is without a doubt the largest presence that Sony has had at, at a Jeff Keighley live stream in a very long time. Um, I, I've never seen them, you know, have this many announcements in some way at a Jeff Keighley show, but it opened with Returnal PC finally confirmed, and this is in collaboration with Climax Studios that are helping out with this PC version. And they're light on details here, but it's the full game. So we're talking story, the Tower of Sisyphus, the online co-op, and there's more news coming early next year. Then they had a, a new trailer for Horizon called Mountain. This was a, a very small, brief trailer, um, nothing too crazy, but we are seeing some new gameplay like fighting a shell walker, so that's pretty cool. Um, next was The Last of Us Part 1's PC trailer coming March 3rd, 2023, so we have a release date. And again, light on details, so they'll talk more about that later, but uh, we do know off the bat this game is up for pre-order already at $59.99, and that's not the first time where the $70 premium is reserved for console, which is a bit bogus, and uh, it seems like that might be a trend that is going to continue. There's not really a huge time delta here from when Part 1 launched on PS5 versus um, the PC version, so we can't necessarily chalk it up to, oh, well, console owners had it first. Um, you know, there's definitely a... Sony's being a bit too mindful of the uh, PC audience, and it's something where you don't want to alienate your console user base. Um, next up was the announcement of Forspoken getting a demo on PSN. It was a total drop right then and there, so it's already live on PSN, uh, which means if you've ever been curious about this game, then this is the time to download it, check it out, see if you uh, like it, or if you, you know, again, if you've ever been curious about if this game uh, actually has a satisfying gameplay loop, then perhaps this demo will finally uh, provide that answer. After that was a very big announcement, and this is another one where, you know, there was a lot of bread, uh, breadcrumbs leading up to this, but Death Stranding 2 announced, confirmed, uh, and that's also a working title, so they might want to change that at some point, but Death Stranding 2 announced for PlayStation 5 on Decima. Um, very exciting stuff. Kojima did not say much of anything outside of recommending people rewatch the trailer and discuss online what they think, and I'm sure there's a lot to uncover there. I already have a lot of thoughts, but I've only seen it once, so um, I'll probably watch it a few more times after this, but uh, yeah, that's a, a major one. And uh, next after that was Horizon Forbidden West, the Burning Shores DLC coming April 19th only for PS5 though. Uh, Guerrilla Games says they've got a larger vision for this so they're moving over to PS5 for this expansion um, but this will have Aloy heading into into Los Angeles to fight on a new threat which it looks like she might be fighting a, a horse which is uh, exciting. I think a lot of Horizon players have you know been theorizing and hoping for something like that. And then finally, uh, the last major announcement for the Game Awards was Final Fantasy, well, one of the last ones, was Final Fantasy 16 gets a release date trailer coming June 22nd. Uh, both this and the Horizon DLC were leaked ahead of time, so we talked about that last week where uh, the snitch had already put out there that FF16 was getting a June 22nd release date, and I had mentioned, you know, based on how they get this info, they're likely going to at least leak a few more things, um, which surprisingly... Uh, just overall, if you watch the whole event, because obviously we're, we're only looking at um, pure PlayStation announcements here, um, but there was a lot in there that, you know, we didn't see coming, which was fun. Like, it was actually a really good show. Um, but they did also leak Horizon, Horizon's Burning Shores DLC a few days before the event, or I think it was like one day before, I can't remember exactly. But either way, um, 
Like I said, this was more or less a state of play or a PlayStation showcase. Really, if you lump in all the third party stuff where there's plenty of you know cool PS4, PS5 games that were also announced from third party during the show, you've basically got a PlayStation showcase, which is interesting. Um, this is why we can never really predict what Sony's doing nowadays. Um, because they could have easily done their own thing in theory, but uh, you know, it's still nice to, you know, have genuine surprises show up like this where, you know, you walking into Jeff Keighley's live streams, they do like to be there with at least one or two things, right? Not a lot, but um, this time around, there was a, a ton to watch if you were a, a PlayStation customer. But uh, I am seeing a lot of people uh, also bring this up, which is um, Sony's not doing a lot of talking nowadays because of the AVK deal uh, with Microsoft acquiring Activision Blizzard, and so they're you know not trying to put info out there that can be used against them with regulators you know watching both companies like a hawk. Uh, that's not happening. So you have to remember that the regulators already have access to internal documents from both of these companies. Uh, even when we get those public statements and those uh, PDFs from you know what's going on between between what Sony said, what Microsoft said, even that stuff has redacted info. The regulators have seen very confidential, important info from both companies. You can't just like freeze your entire your entire business because of this deal. So both Sony and Microsoft are not holding back info. They'll still announce things as they plan to do so. But anyway, let's get into the actual awards part of the award ceremony. And this is where Sony had a lot of nominations, of course. And so that did uh, inevitably lead to some wins. And that's where we can start with um, Christopher Judge winning best performance for his performance in God War Ragnarok. And that is a much deserved win. Um, very happy for him. What's noteworthy here is that he took like seven and a half minutes for a speech, um, <laughs> which was really long, like seven and a half minutes on stage really long. You can tell Jeff Keighley was not thrilled with this, especially because he's trying to keep up like a good pace and he wants the show to not be that long. And also Valve's giving out Steam decks every minute. Like this was like the first thing they opened with basically. And it was just <laughs> funny, but uh, all jokes aside, you can watch his speech and you can tell he was certainly having a moment that was very important to him. So with that said, huge congratulations to Christopher Judge. Uh, now, next up was Best Debut Indie. That was Stray. <laughs> We're going to see Stray again, but you know I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, Best Narrative, God of War Ragnarok. Best Sports and Racing Game, Gran Turismo 7. Best Audio Design, God of War Ragnarok. Best Score and Music, God of War Ragnarok. Innovation and Accessibility also went to God of War Ragnarok. And then Best Independent Game, you better believe it is Stray. Mm, I'm happy to see that. And also Best Action Adventure Game, that went to God of War Ragnarok. And then overall, the Game of the Year was Elden Ring, which is definitely deserved. No doubt about that whatsoever. It's something that we talked about before. There's going to be many publications that hand out this, uh, you know, they do this award ceremony. And so Ragnarok is probably going to get some. So is Elden Ring. At least in this situation, it was, uh, I think, pretty balanced where, you know, Ragnarok certainly excels in certain areas. So it picked up a lot of, uh, picked up a lot of awards in uh, separate categories. But um you know, Elden Ring uh, picked up outside of Game of the Year was Best Direction and something else, I think. But, um, you know, some games can win a lot of awards in smaller categories, but just you can have something else that comes together much more in a much more refined package. Uh, and for a game that not only just has uh, a very engaging gameplay loop that you can spend a lot of time with, uh, but it's also multi-platform, so it's just, it's going to resonate with a lot of people, and uh, Elden Ring, that was a big win, and certainly a deserved win. Now, this is the part where it gets weird, though, because <laughs> near the end of the show, when everything's all said and done, Miyazaki's wrapping up his, uh, his speech, just some random kid, out of nowhere, I guess the kid was, like, there the whole time, walks up to the mic, starts talking about Rabbi Bill Clinton stuff, it was so weird. You know, if you're sitting there watching it, you you, you almost couldn't believe that that happened. So I, I had to send out a tweet. I'm like, what was that? And then everybody's like asking that. <laughs> Super weird. Uh, so that kid like totally trolled the game awards. Um, 
And that, that just sucks for what was a really important moment for Miyazaki. Uh, winning game of the year. Also, Jeff Keighley's show, which, you know, he puts a lot of energy and uh, love into it. And uh, so shortly after that happened, he confirmed on Twitter that that kid was arrested. And as of right now, on the Twitter timeline, there's already, like, you know, news coming out about what went down with that kid and why that even happened. What a weird situation. Um, but outside of that and the long Christopher Judge uh, speech, very good award show. Um, you know, Jeff Keighley catches a lot of heat for often really hyping up his shows. And look, he's always going to do that. You're never going to get him, like, come out with, you know, Summer Games Fest or, uh, or the Game Awards and just be like, eh, you know what, son, it's just not really going to be that good this year. He's never going to do that, um, especially because there's a lot of money involved and things like that, right? So it's just, he's always going to try and talk up a show. But this one was really good for sure. A lot of surprising, uh, genuine announcements in there that... Um, you know, it's always a good balance of having the awards and a celebration of the industry and, and then having these, uh, you know, world premieres for, for game announcements, which makes it a bit more exciting to watch for those that maybe aren't nearly as, nearly as invested for watching the awards ceremony. So I thought this was a great show this year. Next up, let's go over a few smaller stories before we get to our ABK news. So uh, first, PSVR 2 pre-orders. More invites recently went out, which we talked about last week for December 6th. So right on the 6th, that was the uh, PSVR 2 event that Sony was talking about. So um, there's more invites. Uh, as of right now, my one side account still has an invite that's active. I can sign in. I can still order PSVR as of right now. In fact, the email um, says that it's just open. Like my account is whitelisted to always log in and order a headset for as long as there's supply up until launch. So um, I think it is going to be pretty easy to get a hold of one of these things. And uh, at some point, I'm sure it'll open up outside of the initial um, invite only system if you're in a territory that you can only order from PlayStation Direct. Uh, but there was also some more launch games announced, uh, which would be Kayak VR Mirage after the fall. Kizuna AI, Touch the Beat, and Moss and Moss Book 2 are getting native PSVR 2 versions as well, uh, both ready for launch on February 22nd. But unfortunately, developer Polyarch has confirmed to Push Square that they will not be offering any upgrade path for current owners. So Moss is $17.99, and Moss Book 2 is going to be $26.99 USD, or you can pick up both for $34.99. So um, we are going to see publishers explore the spectrum here. So some might want to charge a, a $10 fee or something. Some are doing free upgrades like No Man's Sky, and that's great. Other developers, it's at their discretion. Um, so in, in this case, they're saying that they did a lot of work to get this game, to get these games looking you know, nice on PSVR 2, and there's just a lot they had to retool. And so um, they want to charge for it again. Uh, so I will say, if you haven't played either of these games and you are planning to get PSVR 2, this is the way to get them because the you know Moss Book One I had a great time with that on the Thirty Platinums Part Two video. It's such a charming, fantastic, uh, fantastic VR game. I love it so much, and uh, I did not play Book Two because it was so close to well, basically this where you, you got to know that it's getting a PSVR Two version, and that's now confirmed, obviously. Um, but we're getting closer and closer to the full uh, PSVR Two, uh, excuse me, PSVR Two launch lineup. See, normally I would cut that out. Can't right now, there's just too much to go over. Um, but we're getting closer to the full 20, and so <clears throat> we're, we'll probably get the full 20 by, you know, January, I would say, somewhere around there, but uh, still looking not great overall. There's there's no, like, gotta have it sort of thing, but there's still some, some strong stuff in there with uh, notably Horizon and now Moss. Next up, during the 2022 PlayStation Partner Awards, the SI president and CEO Jim Ryan made a surprise appearance to acknowledge the PS5 stock issues in Japan and Asia, where he was quoted saying, We would like to inform everyone that we have resolved the long-term supply issue of PlayStation 5 and will be able to deliver it to many customers in Japan and Asia from this year on shopping season to 2023. We apologize for the inconvenience. So that's good to see, uh, especially because in Southeast Asia and most notably Japan, where PS5 stock is absolutely abysmal, it's really bad, and you can normally tell based on the weekly numbers where uh, at the lowest it's like a few hundred consoles, but normally like a really, uh, like an average bad week is like 
two, 3,000 consoles, somewhere around there. And uh, normally when it ticks up, they can comfortably do 15,000, 20,000 consoles, sometimes more. And uh, so it seems like they should be consistently hitting that number, assuming that the stock issues actually are all sorted, um, which, you know, based on anecdotal evidence and certainly sales numbers, we're seeing that uh, here in the West, PS5 stock is finally much better, considerably better than what it was throughout all of 2020 and 2021. Moving on to our next news story, I'm sure a lot of you will probably remember this, which was uh, before PS5 came out, we had that Unreal Engine 5 demonstration on real PS5 hardware, and that was kind of our early inside look into um, what's possible on PS5. Uh, and so during that demonstration, we saw two new development techniques, which is Nanite and Lumen. Lumen for real-time global illumination and ray-traced reflections, and then Nanite, which is highly detailed, high high polygon count geometry, and that's why that tech demo looked as good as it did. Um, but of course, it's been two years, we're still in that cross-gen period. Uh, but recently, with the release of Unreal Engine 5.1 back in mid-November, now we're seeing an example deployed in real time, uh, an on-the-ground game you can buy, or rather I should say, download and play today. Fortnite Battle Royale. So this game, uh, just, you know, it's always been inoffensive to look at. It's um, actually, it's a good looking game. It, it always has been uh, just based on pure art style alone. It's meant to be cartoony looking, but um, this game is now using Lumen, Nanite, uh, virtual shadow, virtual shadow maps, and also temporal super resolution on current gen consoles. And, and the dramatic jump is uh, pretty wild to see, right? Because again, it is kind of, it is an inoffensive looking game. It's not meant to be mind blowing per se, but it, it does on PS5 now. It looks really, really good, clean, gorgeous looking. Um, and really that's also, I mean, that's good to see, especially because, well, we are in that cross-gen period and so many developers are still uh, feeling comfortable shipping on PS4, Xbox One. And that is largely because also bear in mind that uh, the outgoing platforms, which are PS4 and X1, are so architecturally similar to PS5 and Series X. It's just financially more advantageous to ship everywhere, assuming you're not going to be doing something crazy that the current gen or rather the last gen consoles just can't do and most developers don't really have that kind of budget to push the current gen systems that much anyway so again it, it just makes sense but um to have nanite and lumen deliver these kind of results on again sort of a modest looking game i mean that's really encouraging to see and so we don't even need you know a massive publisher uh like big publishing dollars to put out a you know, huge AAA game, and well, Fortnite's really not a small game either, technically speaking, but um, just in terms of pure visuals, we don't need a game to really just be mind-blowing off the jump. You can see some dramatic improvements by deploying these features on on these games. Um, and so now we know that it's, it's out there and more developers are gonna be leaving PS4 and Xbox One. Um, you know, that player base is going to get much smaller, so despite despite it being financially advantageous to release on those platforms, you're not going to do it if there's no player base there to buy those games. So, you know, by 2023 and certainly for, you know, a lot of devs are moving over finally and that's where the spec minimum is going to shoot up considerably. And also UE5 is a very popular engine. So uh, great news. And this is an awesome example to see uh, finally just, you know, it's out there. Nanite, Lumen, that tech demo we saw a long time ago. This is what they can do when they're actually being utilized. And just off Fortnite alone, really encouraging to see. Now, every so often we have a story that's not directly PlayStation related, but something where um, it's kind of a big deal to at least talk more broadly about the games industry. And so, um, you know, one thing Sony did early on alongside a few other game publishers is they signed up to increase game prices. So um, Sony was the only platform holder, and that's a very specific thing to note. So they weren't the only uh, publisher in general, but they were the only platform holder to start pricing their games a bit higher. So here in the US, that would be $69.99 USD. Recently, Microsoft also confirmed the same thing for next year. So 2023, games like Starfield, um, Redfall, those games are gonna be priced at $69.99 USD. Uh, in a statement to IGN, a Microsoft representative says, and I quote here, 
this price reflects the content, scale, and technical complexity of these titles. As with all games developed by our teams at Xbox, they will also be available with Game Pass the same day they launch. Uh, and that's the one good news here, if we want to be a, a bit more specific about Xbox, is that, uh, you know, you can kind of take this news and really it provides more of a value proposition to Game Pass, which is already a really good deal to begin with. Um, and that very much could see a, you know, price increase in the short term, but even with that, it's, it really softens the blow. Uh, but the point is, um, we now have a second platform holder increasing prices on games, uh, and really the, the only other one we have now is Nintendo, which... It's not like they're not going to eventually get there. We all know how Nintendo also um, is on that more premium side, so to speak, with their games, uh, where they often are very reluctant to do uh, any kind of aggressive sales. They tend to stay around the $59, $99 mark, and you got to wait for a retailer to come in and save you there and do maybe $45.99, but, um, or $44.99, but the point is... Um, there's not many other publishers left that have not moved over to their increased pricing just yet. They're all going to get there eventually. So um, Sony was there first. And they took the brunt of the criticisms, but they're all going to get there at some point. And now Microsoft has as well. All right, are you ready? Uh, strap yourselves in for a massive update on the Microsoft acquisition of Activision Blizzard King because in a three-day like a three -day period, just so much. <laughs> happened right away so um, as always we'll go in order of you know what happened but starting off Microsoft recently confirmed they have reached a 10-year agreement with Nintendo to release Call of Duty on their platforms starting with Nintendo Switch alongside that they've reconfirmed their commitment to releasing Call of Duty on Steam as well in a conversation with the Washington Post, Microsoft's gaming CEO Phil Spencer talks about the timeline of when they would ship on Nintendo, explaining that it would take some time obviously, but also making the assurance that the game would be optimized to run properly within Nintendo's hardware spec. As for the 10-year agreement, Phil says and I quote, It's just about picking an expiration date, not with the goal of ever expiring, but just like the legalese of a document has to say this goes through some date. But once we start working with the platform, just like we have done with Minecraft, both on PlayStation and Nintendo's platform, our goal would be to continue to support these customers. Brad Smith, Microsoft's vice chairman and president, also sent out this quote retweet from Phil Spencer where he says, Our acquisition will bring Call of Duty to more gamers and more platforms than ever before. That's good for competition and good for consumers. Thank you, Nintendo. Any day Sony wants to sit down and talk, we'll be happy to hammer out a 10-year deal for PlayStation as well. Now, it has been confirmed from the Washington Post, and, well, that tweet clearly, that Sony has not accepted their 10-year deal, which was proposed back in early November. Now, going back to Phil Spencer, this time speaking with Bloomberg, he also had this to say about Sony, where he says, and I quote, From where we sit, it's clear they're spending more time with the regulators than they are with us to try and get this deal done. Now, the recent area user EDOS spotted this internal report from MLX, where Sony provided a response to the Nintendo deal. Sony says, and I quote, Activision Blizzard could supply Call of Duty to Nintendo today, but doesn't, because Nintendo's younger audience is not interested in the first-person shooter, and a previous version of the game on its console was a commercial flop. Instead of being a logical business decision, the licensing agreement is a tactic designed to make Microsoft, whose acquisition has drawn concerns in the EU, UK, and US, look cooperative with regulators. Sony goes on to argue that Call of Duty may not easily run on Nintendo Switch, and that Nintendo isn't concerned about equal treatment for its subscription and cloud-based service, where they don't aggressively compete. Now, the really big news after all that is that the FTC has confirmed they are looking to, or they're, they're seeking to block the deal. Um, but there is a caveat to that, which uh, we'll get to in a second here, but basically they have confirmed in a, a, a report on their site that... Um, that they're looking to do something here, which the FTC supplied this following statement. Microsoft would have both the means and motive to harm competition by manipulating Activision's pricing, degrading Activision's game quality or player experience on rival consoles and gaming services, changing the terms and timing of access to Activision's content, or withholding content from competitors entirely, resulting in harm to consumers. So the interesting part here is that this case is not going to federal court but instead through the FTC's administrative process. So Microsoft can settle with the FTC uh, or they can contest it, which in that case would, it would then go to a trial before an administrative law judge. But that's basically where we are. So 
uh, we had heard murmurings that the FTC was looking to likely challenge it or sue or do something right. Um, and if they took it to a federal court, at least, you know, my understanding there is that that's where Microsoft is obviously going to fight it. They've already confirmed that as much that they're planning on uh, contesting it or fighting it or trying to, you know, do what they can to make sure the deal goes through, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but if they're, you know, if they go to a federal court, they might have a, a really good shot of, of winning that situation, um, at least in this administrative hearing they have a chance to um you know create a dialogue and say okay what we're putting on the table right now maybe it's not enough but we'll make more concessions here's what we'll agree to x y and z you know what will make you happy for us to get this deal done and the ftc might be very aggressive and say like we really just do not want this to happen for uh, all these reasons and maybe that's where it can you know they'll start to butt heads a bit more but um you know, as we've gotten into this before so many times, it's like Microsoft, you know, at this point have certainly, I think are in good faith saying, yes, we want to ship Call of Duty everywhere. And I think they will do that on PlayStation. Um, they say 10 years, I mean, before it was three, right? But that's always something where you don't want to over promise if you don't have to. And that is why the three year thing sounded laughable at first but you know they do seem to be in good faith saying that we want to ship them uh ship call of duty on playstation for 10 years and possibly longer than that but um you know it kind of stops there right because they still need some sort of benefit in this nearly 70 billion dollar transaction so it's not like you know they might not be willing to agree to not letting the franchise go on game pass or um perhaps it you know, it extends beyond Call of Duty, right? Where it's still a big question mark on all these other franchises that, um, you know, we touched on that recently. It's like um, a lot of it's focused on Call of Duty. It's a big third party game. That means a lot to PlayStation's bottom line. But um, considering the way Microsoft has handled their acquisitions, it's not only a matter of them picking up a studio, but it actively removes content from PlayStation. So when we're talking about a developer, a developer, a developer, okay, okay, okay. A publisher, okay, well that's a lot of stuff, you know, getting wrapped up uh, all in one fell swoop. Now another one, and that publisher still has a ton of things outside of Call of Duty, so perhaps the concessions also stretch into those franchises as well. Um, and Microsoft may not be willing to do that, but it, there's just so much that can be said. Um, now, as for the whole Nintendo thing, which I'm sure that's, uh, you know, that's obviously... <sighs> The, the thing is, Sony's right, <laughs> and no one wants to really admit that, especially because this whole time it's, we saw this with the CMA thing where the CMA identified that Nintendo games are, or Nintendo's platform speaks to a different audience, and I feel like that was always like a totally normal thing to say that most people seem to understand that since the Wii, it's always been speaking to a slightly different audience. There's crossover, but, you know, typically somebody might own a Wii, a Wii U, nowadays a Switch, and they, they might also own a PS5, an Xbox, a PC, and they'll probably play their, you know, big budget third-party games on that device, right? And so, like, for example, with Call of Duty going to Nintendo, um, you know, cool, obviously, but uh, Activision willingly chose to not ship on those platforms a long time ago because there's likely not much of an audience there that wants to play those games um and they do ship other things on there that are certainly adult oriented but it's more a matter of you know how well those games would sell versus playstation 5 and series x and again the number one thing i think at this point that's really hurting microsoft in particular with this whole um regulatory process because i i've, I've always thought that it was going to go through not no problem but you know i didn't think it was going to be that they would hit this many roadblocks so I think what's really starting to hurt them is that these internal documents that regulators have access to, you know, they're seeing it and it's, it's all published. You know, Microsoft has all these internal documents that track Sony very closely and they compare sales together and they compare their studios together. And, you know, that doesn't help their case at all. They can say things uh, publicly all day, every day about, um, you know, you know, releasing games on Nintendo and how this is about more games and we don't care that much about PlayStation, the deal's about mobile, and those things can all be true. And it can also be true that they track PlayStation as a competitor, and that seems to be really hurting them because um, while they've seemingly been doing good with, you know, phrasing it in a very friendly way and you know, based on where you you know, read and see this stuff, you would think that Sony's the worst, you know, the worst company in the world and the 
multi-trillion dollar company that's buying a 70 billion dollar publisher like they're the good guys in the situation right like they're doing a very good job of this public outreach and making them seem like this is totally a good thing and as i've said plenty of times i don't think there's really a winner in either situation neither of these are the good guys but um that can't be helping them now I also find it a bit weird that Microsoft has also, uh, I think it was Brad Smith in his op-ed on the Washington Post, I think, or was it the, somewhere he made an op-ed, and there he made a very interesting comment about how Sony is, um, you know, they're Blockbuster in this situation. He said, uh, Sony is as excited about this deal as Blockbuster was about the rise of Netflix, which is not really the best way to phrase that because you're kind of implying that Sony is the one that's going to be you know, kicked out of the marketplace because they're not keeping up with the times. And I don't think that's really what you want to say to regulators if you're trying to say that this is good for competition and it's like a rising, like a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. Like that doesn't really look any good. Uh, and also, I'm not sure how big of a role this plays in Sony's decision making. I'm sure it's certainly something they, they're considering, but, uh, and, and it's something I have not brought up before, but it's a matter of you know, what do you do when you've got a big publisher that's now owned by Microsoft and let's say, okay, they still want to ship on PlayStation, no problem indefinitely. But when it comes to the next platform cycle, you're sending out very confidential dev kits to what are now a bunch of Microsoft studios. Um, and so normally during that process, there's a lot of lawyers involved when you set, when you send those dev kits out to third parties. Um, of course, airtight, very secure NDAs, but um, I'm not sure if that can be done in such a way where it, where it safeguards that information from being purely at the studios and it doesn't reach somebody, um, you know, Microsoft corporate side where they're planning their own silicon, right? Like, I, you know, it's just, that's a whole messy thing that I'm sure Sony is, is obviously considering alongside everything else, right, where that becomes a major, major issue. Um, and granted, there's, like, kind of a lot of things going on nowadays with, like, MLB going everywhere and, uh, you know, Minecraft is still seeing continued support, right? So, and now with Bungie as well. So, you know, the, the dialogue there might change, but still something I, I thought was worth pointing out. But um, anyway, this, uh, this administrative hearing apparently won't happen until around August 2023. Now, Microsoft was thinking this was going to close around June. So that means this process is going to be a lot longer than, than we were thinking. And that's just off of the FTC alone, the EU, and of course, you know, the CMA are, are probably going to, you know, drag this out a bit longer. So yeah, we'll be talking about this one for a long time, but that is the latest update on the ABK situation. Now, recently, we had some more Days Gone drama come up, which uh, at this point, it's again on the same general topic we've seen before, which is the early review scores and also the animosity that the former directors have uh, regarding that whole situation. So uh, we'll try to go over this a bit quickly, but uh, what happened was the former writer-director on Days Gone, John Garvin, was quote retweeting somebody about the PC review score, uh, mentioning that, um, hey, it was me and Jeff Ross that had to leave and we did, we, we were responsible for most aspects of the game outside of the performance and bugs. And, uh, but yet the scores, uh, you know, showed differently or whatever. And then somebody else was talking about how, um, again, they were surprised about the review scores or whatever, and how, uh, how do they turn out that way? And John Garvin says three reasons. Um, it had tech issues. It had reviewers who couldn't be bothered to actually play the game. And three, it had woke reviewers who couldn't handle the gruff, uh, couldn't handle a, a gruff white biker looking at his date's ass. Um, and then Ben Studio had to, well, they didn't have to, but a few days later they did uh, respond to this saying that we are aware of the comments made by our previous creative director on Days Gone regarding his personal view on the critical reception of our intellectual property. Ben Studio does not share his sentiment, nor does it reflect the views of our team. Our studio is immensely proud of the work we accomplished on Days Gone and are thankful to every developer who poured their heart and soul into it. We are incredibly humbled by the support of our Days Gone community, and we will continue to share your enthusiasm for our world and characters as we look toward the future. Uh, good comments from Ben Studio, of course, and uh, at least for John Garvin. Really disappointing to see that that's still how he's like acting about the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I, I can, I sympathize with anybody that's in a creative field and, you know, you put your heart and soul into something and especially for, you know, a multi-year process and you're involved in so many aspects of the, the project that you're working on and you put it out there and, 
you get all this criticism and sure maybe some of it is you know unsavory or piling on in a way, in a way that you that you feel isn't really fair um and yeah maybe that's you know there's certainly examples you can find i i would assume but uh you just you can't you can't act like this uh not now look if you have nothing good to say then then don't say it at all but it's you know a matter of throwing your former team under the bus and uh you know placing all the blame on them and everything else that you did was was good and perfect um and of course the obvious deflection of the word woke which so many seem to use nowadays to deflect anything that's even remotely considered valid criticism that word has completely lo completely lost all meaning in the in the past like three four years or something it's just such a weird uh kind of like really thing when you hear that word come up and it's always used in this kind of context where you know it seems like it that always is what it leads to it just it sucks that john garvin is still doing this um I really hope he can find some resolve over time with this whole situation because, again, I, I, I get it, but you can't let it control your emotions like this, and uh, I would hope that he at least realizes that. Next up, this past week we just got a full official two-minute trailer for The Last of Us HBO TV series, and uh, man, it's looking so good. So a lot of crucial moments from the game being displayed in this trailer. Uh, we're finding out what characters Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson play. So Ashley Johnson, it looks like she's playing a scene where it's Ellie's mother giving birth. Um, at least that's the running theory that makes the most sense. Um, Troy Baker is in David's crew towards the end of the game or end of the show, I should say. And uh, we're seeing things from Left Behind. We're seeing other uh, prominent characters. And, uh, well, there's also the fact that, you know, thus far they've been fairly light on showing infected and clickers. Um, you know, they kind of do a small thing here with the one clicker, but now we're seeing towards the end of this that they, that they did show a bloater and that was really awesome. But, um, you know, obviously, uh, feeling very positive about it, not going to like sit here and, you know, sell it to the world per se and act like it's going to be the best thing ever because it's not here yet, but it will be here very soon. Uh, but it does feel like this might, you know, this series might land in a very big way. I mean, the, the trailer already has like 10 something million plus views uh, just on one upload or across a few others. I'm sure it's a, a ridiculous number, but there's a lot of eyes on this show and it might land in a very, very big way. Um, so January 15th, it can't come soon, uh, soon enough. I, I have not been this excited for a TV show in a long time because I'm not really that big on TV, but uh, this, I'll be there on day one. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about you all. And our Tuesday video was looking at PS5's UI as sort of a love-hate relationship kind of thing uh, for me. Um, I mostly have a great time with it. I think it's great, uh, but there's some things in there that really keep me from totally loving it. So go check that out. And then as always, uh, more uploads, uh, another upload on Tuesday. I might have one for you on Saturday though, which will be kind of just a kind of a mashup of all the PS5 games coming out in 2023. Just a good way to visually see everything coming out next year, but that might be this Saturday. So stay tuned for that or tomorrow, I should say, but, um, that's pretty much it. So uh, that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.